This is lecture CC3. Uh, we're going to be starting with the world's dumbest definition of life, and then go on to why you are, in fact, a spaceship. After that, we'll talk a little bit about cell membranes, uh, what, they, what their job is, the structure of the phospholipid bilayer, and what sorts of things can cross a phospholipid bilayer. And then we'll get into another major component of membranes, which is the membrane proteins. We'll talk about how they interact with the membrane and the different jobs that they can do as part of a membrane. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the processes by which some things move across the membrane, specifically passive transport mechanisms like diffusion and osmosis. All right, we're going to start this lecture with what I like to call Dr. Rad's dumbest definition of life of all time. That is this. Ta-da! Dr. Rad's definition of life is that the inside is not the same as the outside. And here's the basic idea behind this possibly oversimplistic way of defining it. The idea is that all at a chemical level, since life seems to depend on having a particular fairly complex biochemistry, and that biochemistry, what happens in that chemistry depends on what kind of molecules you have and having them in the right areas together in the right amounts to do the right reactions along with the right enzymes. We need a way to keep certain molecules in certain places. So if we assume that life is taking place in a watery environment, we need a way to set aside this water from this water. And we want to have some kinds of molecules that are in here, but not out here. And other molecules that are out here, but not in here. We want the stuff in here to be all set up to do all of the complex biochemistry we need. And that means having some things that are definitely in here and some things that are definitely not because they would interfere with that. Which means we want the inside to not be the same as the outside. And a large part of what we've talked about, the in fact, the very idea of homeostasis is oriented around that. Keeping this internal environment controlled, keeping the right things present in here and the right things not in there also, even when things are different out here. That's the job of any living thing that has a border between it and the environment. And all living things do because they have to keep their inside different from the outside. If you took me and chopped me up into molecular sized pieces, took all of the molecules that make up my body and put them in a vat of water just this size, you would not get a living thing. And part of that is because all the molecules would all be mixing together and you wouldn't be able to control which things were interacting with which other things. In other words, the inside and the outside would not be the same. It'd all be one slurry, to use a kind of unpleasant term. Instead, inside my body, I have lots of systems of membranes which divide me up into different compartments, and those compartments have their own mix of molecules, and having the right molecules in each area lets the right chemistry happen, and that's how you get interesting things like people. So, in order for us to do this, we need to be able to have some kind of border that separates inside from outside. And we need that border to be able to do a bunch of stuff. We need it to control the movement of things so that things don't just wander out or come in freely. We need it to prevent most movement, to allow some movement, and also to allow information to cross this. Sometimes we need things outside to know about what's inside without actually detecting them. And sometimes we need the stuff inside to know what's out here without it actually entering the cell. So in order to get that idea across, we're actually going to back up a step and talk about one kind of broader idea of the idea of life. So let's imagine going back to the very first organisms that had cells as we would recognize them. So here is my early single-celled organism. Now to be a living thing, it's gonna to have to bring materials in from the outside to the inside. Some things we want to bring in. 
So this thing gets its materials from the world around it. It probably lives in a puddle somewhere. So the water out here has food that it wants or other materials that it needs. So it brings them in across this border from outside to inside. Other things are wastes. It makes things in the process of doing its biochemistry that it doesn't want to keep. So those wastes have to be moved from inside to outside. Again, out through the border. So our border has to be able to do those. And this thing gets its food from the environment around it and gets rid of its wastes into the environment around it. Works very well for a single-celled organism in a puddle. So now, though, let's say that this either makes another cell but doesn't split off from it or starts working with another cell and they attach to each other. And now you've got an organism with two cells. Each of these still has access to the world around it, so each of them still brings in food from, the, food from around it and gets rid of waste into the stuff around it. Still fine. So what if we get a three-celled organism? Well, each of them still has access to the world. Same process works. But as we start adding more cells, we're going to get to a point. Notice, if I add another cell here, this cell in the middle now has a bit of a problem. It can't get stuff directly from the world around it because it's blocked by all these other cells. And when it gets rid of its wastes, they're not going to the world around it. They're going right onto its neighbors. It's peeing on their heads. Now, in actuality, if you're just one cell away, it's probably not that big of, not that big of a problem. But as we add more, it is going to be a problem. If we add many more layers of cells, this cell won't be able to get any food and it won't be able to get rid of wastes. So as we build this organism, we might want to leave an opening here so this cell still has access to the world around it. And as we add even more cells to our growing organism, we've got to keep that channel open. And as we continue adding cells, if I add another one here, this one's going to have a problem. So I'm going to have to leave a channel open here. And likewise, let's see, this one has access to the world here. So we can, you get the idea. As we build this, there's going to be tunnels inside this organism so that all of these cells can still get access to the world around them for bringing in nutrients and getting rid of wastes. But then we get something interesting. For various reasons, either it wants this organism is moving into a new environment, or it's for some other reason to its advantage to do this, this growing organism may end up encasing itself in a shell of some sort made of cells. So now, here's outside, here's the world around it. Here's inside. These cells no longer have access to outside, which means that these cells now have the job of controlling the movement of nutrients in and wastes out. But now these cells are existing in a watery environment that's contained within the organism. So now we draw a difference between outside and then this fluid in here. And there's lots of different names you call this depending on what kind of organism you're talking about, but I'm going to right now call it extracellular fluid. Now, the internal cells of this organism are living in a bath of extracellular fluid, and it's the job of these cells on the outside to regulate things moving into and out of the organism. So now we have a two-stage process. We bring nutrients from outside into the extracellular fluid, and then these cells can get them from that. They get rid of their wastes, and then we have something which brings the wastes from this extracellular fluid out to the world out here. So my cells are now in this extracellular fluid, and now it's the job of the rest of this organism to keep this fluid the right environment for these cells to live in. And that is a big part of how your body works. Your body's job is largely to regulate the fluid around your cells so they get the nutrients they want and get rid of the waste they need to get rid of. A lot of what your body does is about maintaining that fluid. And think, if you want to use kind of a weird analogy, think about this. These cells were fine in their puddle, but let's say they want to move on to land where it's dry. 
Well, in that case, they still need to be in a watery environment. So this organism has now has some sort of shell or envelope that holds the fluid in. These cells are made to resist damage from the dryness out here, and these cells get to stay in their fluid. Think about if humans want to leave Earth and go to the moon. Humans need to be in air that contains oxygen and has a certain temperature, and we breathe out carbon dioxide, and we need to get that out of there. Here in the atmosphere, that's not too bad. I can breathe in the oxygen that's in the atmosphere and breathe out my CO2, and it goes and helps the plants. But if I want to go to the moon, there's no oxygen in CO2 in space. There's no oxygen in space. So I need to build something which will hold in air at the right temperature to keep me alive. In other words, I need to build a shell that holds an environment inside that I am comfortable with, that has the resources I need. I'm going to make an argument that the, what these cells have done by building an organism is build a spaceship allowing them to explore hostile environments while still living in what amounts to that puddle that they started out in all those years ago. You, your body, is a spaceship for your cells, allowing them to exist in a hostile environment like dry land while still maintaining the puddle that they used to live in. I kind of like thinking of it like that. So if you want to, as we go through this course, if you want to think about the body as a spaceship, there's some interesting parallels to be made there. Okay, but anyway, moving that aside, let's get back to another one of the other ideas here, which is that how do I get stuff, how do I keep this environment different from this environment and different from this environment? Well, this border or this border has to be something which doesn't allow most things to pass, but does allow some things to pass. So let's see, what do we need that border to do? If each of these entities is a cell, then the border around it, its edge, we're going to call the cell membrane. This is the thing that separates inside from outside. In a way, it's, the, def it's a, a, the defining thing of this living thing. So what do we need it to do? We need it to prevent the random movement, the random crossing of most molecules. But we need it to allow or force the movement of some molecules. So when I've got something, I'd say an enzyme inside the cell, that enzyme has a job. It catalyzes a particular reaction. I don't want it just wandering off. Likewise, if there are other things outside in the world that might interfere with the functioning of the cell, I don't want them just wandering in. So my membrane has to prevent most things from crossing randomly. But on the other hand, I do need nutrients in and wastes out. So it does have to either allow those to move or force them to move, grab them and pull them in or push them out. Both of those are possible. I also need to be able to get information about the world. Sometimes the machinery inside the cell needs to do something different based on what's outside. For example, if the cell needs nutrients, it may need to know how to move to get them, which means it needs to know where to go. If the nutrients aren't coming in, how does the cell know how to move? Well, somehow we've got to have the, look, the nutrients outside where they are send a signal into the cell that tells the cell how to respond. Or if there's something out there that it doesn't want to be near, say it's too hot, we need some sort of information that tells the cell, do something else in response. So in for, even if the molecules aren't crossing the membrane, we need information to. We need signals to be able to get in and out. We also need to be able to display information. Sometimes other cells need to know what this, what's going on in this cell. For example,
Some other cell might need to know, am I a kidney cell or a brain cell or a blood cell? And they can't come in to interrogate the machinery in the cell, so the cell needs some way of putting information out there saying, here's what kind of cell I am. Here's what body I belong to. I have been invaded by a virus or other information that's important for other cells to know about. So it's not just a wall. You could almost imagine this with a castle wall analogy. So imagine that your cell is a castle. What do we need a castle wall to do? One thing is that it keeps the barbarians out. So the barbarians can't just run up and come in and sack, sack the little town inside the castle. Mostly they can't come in. And we may not want just we may not want the crops we're growing to just randomly get randomly roll away. So we need a wall that prevents bad things from coming in and good things from going out. Except sometimes we want them to. So our castle wall can't just be a wall of stone, it has to have gates. Those gates will allow the, pe the things we want to come in and the things we want to get rid of to go out. But they're controlled, not just random. We can open and close them and they may only be the right size for certain things. We also might need to know what's going on out there. So you might imagine that the people who live in our castle might want to know if the barbarians are coming. Maybe that tells them, okay, we need to make sure we bring in the wet, bring in the crops and bring in the people outside and prepare stuff in here. Let's get the catapults ready or something. I don't know. So we want to know when the barbarians are coming, but we don't want to know because they just came in. If the barbarians have come into the castle, we have a problem. So how do we know when the barbarians are coming if we can't know because they came in? Well, we need someone standing on the wall looking out there and going, look! Barbarians! Now think about that. If the guard on the wall looks out and says, Hey, look, barbarians! The people in the castle know that there are barbarians out there. But they don't know it because they saw a barbarian. They know it because the presence of a barbarian out there caused something to happen at the wall, which sent a signal, the word barbarian, into the castle. We went from barbarian to the word barbarian. Not the same thing but it still allows the, the inside of the castle to do something in preparation. Or, and people walking by might, not want, might want to know, what does this castle have to sell? Or who does it belong to? Or when is market day? So we might want to have some way of putting posters on the outside of the wall that say, market day is Monday, and we have carrots to trade or something. I don't know. You get the idea. A cell is a little bit like a castle, and the cell membrane has to be able to do many of the same things that a castle wall has to be able to do. So let's talk about how it does it. So our cells exist in a watery environment. In order for our cell membrane to function, it has to be something which will, which will not dissolve in water. It can't just come apart. We can't make it out of salt crystals, for example. And it probably has to be able to change its shape a little bit. It needs to be flexible. And it needs to be able to do things like let some things through, but not everything. Well, there isn't one molecule that's going to do all that thing, all of that. But let's start with what we can do to, that will be something that holds its shape, that stays together in a watery environment without being completely rigid. And you may remember when we talked about biomolecules, we talked about one lipid called a phospholipid. That was the one that had the hydrophilic head, it was a charged phosphate, and some lipophilic fatty acid tails. And we said that when you put enough of these in water, one of the things they can form is this structure called a phospholipid bilayer. These form on their own. You don't have to force them to do it. If you just dump some phospholipids into water, you'll get some of this. So these are arranging themselves in such a way that their lipophilic fatty acid tails are all together here and both on the outside where there's water and on the inside where there's water, the hydrophilic heads are interacting with that water. We can complete this idea by showing that these come together and we've got a continuous bilayer. This is just kind of zooming in on one part of it. You can imagine the same pattern continuing. 
Now what we've done here is made a wall which, separate, which sets off this inside water from this outside water. Now the nice, one nice thing about this is that it holds together very well in the water. Imagine that we broke this and opened a big gap in it. So here comes the water coming in. Now think about what's going to happen. Water, water molecules, hydrogen bonding to other water molecules, sticking together in clumps, start coming in. They're fine interacting with these hydrophilic heads, but in here, they can't have any interactions with those lipophilic tails. There's no part of that that's polar or charged for them to bond with. So as a rule, they'd rather be with other water molecules, so they're pretty unlikely to come very far in here. They're going to tend to stay with the water, which means this will, on its own, seal up. These two sides will just come together and close that gap. Sort of like if you've ever looked at a lava lamp, you could, you could poke your finger into one of those big waxy balls, but when you took it out, it wouldn't leave a hole in it. It would just seal back up. This is kind of similar. So this is a self-sealing membrane. If it breaks, it just closes itself back up, which is a useful feature. Now, Will it stop things from crossing? Well, let's talk about what can cross a cell membrane like this. So give me just a moment here. We could talk, actually, before I do that, let's talk about a couple of other things here. Let's, first, let's talk about how this makes it look like this membrane is very thick compared to the cell. But if we were to draw it more accurately, this phospholipid bilayer, its total thickness, uh, it varies, but you might put this at five to six nanometers. Uh, in one of the labs, we talk about metric conversions. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So imagine a meter, divide that by, into a billion pieces. Each you know, one is now way too small to see. A nanometer is roughly 10 hydrogen atoms across. This is about five or six nanometers. So you could count the number of atoms across this, um, not with all fingers and toes probably, but with a couple people's fingers and toes. Compare that to the size of a cell, which is usually going to be mm, 10 micrometers or so across. And you're, this is a cell is roughly a thousand times bigger than this. So this is a little bit like uh, the analogy I heard is imagine a watermelon is the cell. The cell membrane would be the thickness of a sheet of paper wrapped around that watermelon compared to the size of the cell. So this is very, very narrow. It's a thin, thin membrane compared to the cell. Now, let's talk about what can go through this. Now, there's some space here between the fatty acid tails. They aren't packed in right up on top of each other. So in theory, very small things could go through. So let's think about that. What might be able to go through this? Well, let's, let's think about some small things. Let's erase this and make a little list here. Um, let's start with uh, single atoms, like ions, like the sodium ion. So ions, things like sodium, chloride, single atoms. Now, a single, on this scale, a single atom is maybe that big. That's small enough to slip through here. Physically, it's, it's small enough that it could get through this without too much trouble. But it's probably not going to. And let's think about why. Let's say this is a sodium ion, Na+. Remember, charged things have an extremely strong tendency to not want to be on their own. They try to be near other oppositely charged things. The only reason this can be on its own, remember, is that it's surrounded by water molecules with their slightly negative oxygen sides kind of hold, keeping it happy. So it can wander around with the water here, but now imagine it starts slipping through this membrane and it gets into here. The water's not going to come with it. Remember, water wants to be with other water. So as it gets here, it's, you can almost imagine it looking ahead and seeing this big area here where there are no negative charges to stabilize it. It's like the big dark forest, and there's nothing in there where, that's going to keep it from being a lone positive charge, which is the thing it can never do. So, is it likely to go this way, where it's going to be an isolated positive charge? 
or back out this way where there's water and other negative charges to make it happy. Well, def the chance of it going this way is very, very low. Technically speaking, it's not zero. Physically, it's not impossible for a sodium ion to wander through there. There's enough space. But the probability is so small that it is effectively guaranteed not going to happen. So we would say that charged things like ions, positive or negative, do not pass through this membrane. Or more technically, the rate at which they pass through it is so small as to be effectively zero. So we'll say these do not cross. Now, sometimes we want them to cross, but we're going to talk in a little bit about how that can happen without violating this principle. Uh, let's talk about some other small things. Let's say like water. Water, H2O. Just three atoms in that, only slightly larger than our sodium ion. Water is also small enough to get through here. So can it? Okay. It's neutral. It's not charged. So it doesn't have to be around oppositely charged things. It's a neutral molecule. So water, can it go through here? Yeah. If it moves up here and sees the dark forest of nonpolar bonds ahead of it, that's not inherently unstable for it. But... Remember, water forms hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. And as a rule, when things can form bonds, they will. So like, like we had before, my water molecule wanders up to here, and ahead of it, it sees nothing to bond with. And behind it, it sees water to bond with. It's unlikely to go this way, but more likely than the sodium was. The chance of the sodium going this way is virtually zero. The chance of the water doing it is not zero. So does water pass through this? Somewhat. Not freely. It's not just going to drift through it like it's not even there. It will restrict the movement of water, but not usually prevent it. So water can cross somewhat. Water will cross these phospholipid bilayers. Some of them less well than others. You may remember that we talked about cholesterol as a component of cell membranes, and we mentioned that cholesterol kind of sits in here in between the phospholipids. You can imagine then that if there's a cholesterol here, that makes it harder for the water to get through. As a rule, the more cholesterol there is in a membrane, the less well water will go through it. It's kind of, it almost waterproofs the membrane. And in some areas that's important. Like when we talk about in the kidneys, some cells don't allow water to pass easily. Something to keep in mind. All right, uh, let's look at some other molecules like gases, for example. Uh, let's look at oxygen and carbon dioxide. Again, small molecules. So here's an oxygen, here's a CO2. Small enough to go through here. They're really not bigger than water. So will they? Well, we said water was polar, which means it tended to stick to other polar things. So it was unlikely to go through here. As a rule, Polar things do not go well through this hydro, this lipophilic inner core. But gases are nonpolar, most of them. So like oxygen is, ox is oxygen double bound to an oxygen. Carbon, so that's oxygen double bound to oxygen, two big sisters, no polarity. Carbon dioxide is carbon bound to two oxygens. While that is a polar bond, as is that, the two polar bonds are equal and opposite out here. So the whole molecule doesn't have any very strong polarity, which means they are not strongly interacting with the water around them. So they go through here pretty easily. They're small enough to slip through and they don't have anything in particular stopping them. So we're going to say gases pass freely. Okay. Let's consider some other ones. There's a kind of a whole class of molecules that we might call small organics. These would be things like glucose, amino acids, nucleotides. Basically, the monomers that we talked about when we talked about biomolecules. On this scale, they're going to be a little bit bigger. So 
say glucose might be maybe that big. That's a very rough estimate. If Don't criticize me too much if I'm off on that. That's getting too big to pass through these. There's just not enough of a gap there. Plus, remember, glucose and most of these are very polar. They're hydrophilic. Water interacts well with them, which means not only are they too big to easily fit through here, but they're still stuck to the water. So as they go in, the water is effectively going to tend to kind of encourage them to come back out and play with the water. Going through here, there's nothing for them to bind to. So these generally do not cross. With a few exceptions. Something like a steroid might well be a little bit big to fit through there, but remember, steroids do just fine in this lipophilic area because they are also lipophilic. So if a steroid can get to the membrane, it can slip its way through here and go through. So many lipids can pass through cell membranes. So we'll say, except some lipids, especially steroids. Steroids go right through cell membranes. Doesn't even really slow them down. Now, the, only, the other class we talked about are the bigger biomolecules, like proteins or big glucose polymers or things like that. On this scale, a typical protein might be, well, there's part of it. They're big. So proteins, for example, are just too big. They just can't pass through because they're just enormous. So we'll say proteins do not cross. It's not that proteins can never go into or out of a cell. It's that they can't just go through the cell membrane. We're going to have to have some other way of moving them in or out. So that's a kind of a summary of what a cell membrane is made of and what kind of things can easily cross or can't easily cross. This explains some of the castle wall, but it doesn't explain some of the other functions, like how do we let some things through sometimes? Sometimes we want glucose to come into this cell. So how does it go through if it can't go through the cell membrane? How do we display information? How do we bring information in? That's for our next bit of the lecture.